Office 365 primarily. Um, day to day, I'm an incident responder, uh, digital forensics. And then um, as we have time, our team develops this, this tool called Konza, which is uh, an open source um, PowerShell framework for doing incident response. And uh, we'll get into how it works a little bit here in a second. Um, so the idea is, right, you've got traditional um, timelining. You have a system. It pops an alert. The first thing you do is you take a disk image, you start analyzing it, you build a timeline, and that gives you all the data that you need then to put together your case. Um, but what happens if where's work? Come huh, there we go. What happens if this is your scope? Right? You don't have one system. You have a hundred systems. You have a thousand systems. You have a hundred thousand systems. Right? How do you do the kind of in-depth forensic analysis you need to do to get a good idea of what's happening at that scale? So one of the solutions uh, is Kanza. I don't know if it's going to scan. That's um, the QR code leads to the repo out on GitHub. Um, how it generally works. You have one system that is kind of the master controller. It loads in a whole bunch of modules that are PowerShell scripts. And then that connects out into your data center to a list of targets that you've specified using PowerShell remoting, WinRM, um, with, usually with Kerberos, it's pretty domain dependent, but um, doesn't give up your creds because it doesn't do any, uh, any delegation, but it still gets out there and it, it gets you the data that you need, right? There are currently, I think, 35 modules um, that collect anything from auto start entry points, uh, network artifacts, things like that. Dave gave a talk, Dave Hull, who uh, originally wrote the tool, gave a talk at last year's summit. I'd suggest you go look at it if you're interested in Kanza. Um, it's, it's a great overview of how the tool is architected and why we did the, made the decisions we did. Um, of course, there's still, it's a tool, right? There, there are assumptions that are made. There are some drawbacks. Um, we work in a 100% server environment. Right, and the tool is developed by a team then that works in a 100% server environment. We don't have client machines. So Kanza assumes that these hosts are gonna be online for the entire time of the analysis. Right, if the machine suspends, because there's no agent, it's entirely call out, um, it's gonna kill the job and it's gonna fail. Uh, and, and we've got some stuff that, that's actually out of order. Um, we've got some stuff in the pipeline for that, but. So why would you want to use Kanza? Well, it's all PowerShell based. PowerShell is on every Windows host, right? Since Windows 7, or since Windows Vista, you've had PowerShell installed by default. Since Windows 7, it's been 3.0, uh, which has a lot of advanced capabilities. Uh, 4 is out now, 5 is coming. Every iteration of PowerShell, they add more and more things you can do with it. Uh, the majority of Kanza is PowerShell 2.0, uh, compliant, it will work in 2.0. There are a handful of modules that require three uh, because of some of the .NET libraries they, they use. Um, specifically, the module we're in, I'm going to talk about here uh, allows you to do that raw disk access, but doesn't require any third-party drivers. Everything in it is first-party. Everything in it's from Microsoft. It's on every host. It's already there. There's nothing to install on your endpoints because Kanza is agentless. And so really the, the bottom line is, if you're running a Windows environment, you already have everything you need in place on every host in your environment to run Kanza and use it effectively. So backing up one, so what, what are we gonna use here? What's my talk about? So each module, again, is a PowerShell script. They either can be used within the framework or they can be used standalone. So git master file table ps one um, is the new module that this talk is based around. Um, and it, it uses uh, 
uses .NET calls to address the physical device, the actual hardware um, namespace, and read the raw bytes off of the disk as opposed to using Windows API calls. Um, it uses that then to parse through the MFT, walks through it, pulls every entry, parses it, and reports back a PowerShell object that has the key bits of information that you can use to build a timeline. Um, by default, is going to put that in a, a CSV file per host. Um, if you want to run it standalone, of course, you can ac export it to whatever you want. Um, here, I'm exporting it to CSV. Um, you can see how it does the, yeah, it analyzes the diff. That didn't work. Do I thought it would? Uh, analyzes the disk, reads the master boot record, figures out where the drives are. Um, it's, it's pretty well documented, so the, the code itself can, can walk you through how it works. Um, so now you've done that. Now you've got all this data. Here's kind of the meat, right? You've got data. How are you going to use it? You have to be able to analyze that data. You've collected MFT stuff from 100,000 hosts, but now you've got that, that you have to actually use it here. So this is, uh, this is an example from one of the cases where we used it. Um, we took the, uh, built a bubble chart in Excel. Yeah. Uh, we built a bubble chart in Excel. Each, uh, the two axes here, the, the y-axis is the MFT number. The x-axis is the uh, standard information created time, normalized down to the, to the day. The uh, MFT numbers are normalized to the thousands. The size of each bubble, then, is the number of entries at that intersection. And you can see how it, it builds a pretty general curve, right, um, as you'd expect. But then you have a couple of outliers, specifically this one. Um, this file was the original file on disk, which is why it has such a low MFT number. But the SI created date was time stomped. Uh, and specifically, they made a copy of it. Again, new file, high MFT number, same SI created date, and that had a backdoor. It was a, a PowerShell script that was loaded up every time an, an administrator logged onto the system, automatically downloaded a zombie, called out uh, to the C2 infrastructure. Fortunately, this was our red team, <laughs> our in-house red team and not an actual attacker. Um, but this kind of the, is one of the ways you can use that data, right? So looking at the other option, oh, sorry. How do you build that chart, right? Useful information. Um, so this is using log parser. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Most people are. Um, it allows you to run basically SQL queries against flat files. So you can do a select here. You're grabbing the SI created date, breaking down the MFT entries uh, to the thousands, and selecting a count. You output that to, um, I saved it to a CSV open an exchange, and it will automatically build you the bubble chart. You just have to highlight the data and say, go to an XY scatter chart, build me a bubble chart. And then you get, there you go, you get this graph, right? So that's one way to use it. Of course, there are tons of other ways. So other things you can do, right? Um, because you're collecting data at scale, you can start running statistics. You can do least frequency analysis. You have all of the files by name and path. Um, why not stack rank those? Stack rank sys32, look for every DLL, right? Every executable, every, sh every script. Um, across 100 machines of the same role, one of those has one file that's out of place. Well, you do a least frequency analysis, that pops to the top of the list, right? Um, large files looking for stage exfiltration. You get the file size, that's in the MFT. 
you have the file size information then for every file on every host across your environment, you know you shouldn't have anything that's multiple gigabyte, you know, hundreds of gigabytes. Uh, but you see them anyway, right? Depending on how you cut the data it in. You can, you can raise these things to the top of the list. Um, because it reads the MFT raw, as opposed to relying on the API, you get the deleted entries, right? Your inactive entries in the MFT. So go through and list all of the deleted executables on disk. Uh, excuse me. Uh, look through that. What's staged, right? Um, deleted executables in the recycle bin. Kind of strange. Could be interesting, right? If it doesn't happen often, right? least frequency analysis again, then you now have something interesting to go look at. Um, On-demand compiler residue. This is something we see specifically with um, uh, PowerSploit, the PowerSploit framework. Anytime you use add type in a, um, in a PowerShell script to compile C Sharp on the fly, uh, so you're loading a DLL, right, or, or something like that. That leaves files on the disk. Those files then become interesting artifacts that you can look for. Uh, and, and the way you can use it kind of, there's, there's as many ways to slice the data as you can think of. Sorry, this is back there. Okay, thanks. Okay. So, um, the tool itself, right? Uh, get master file tables. It's it's still in beta version. Um, I'm going to push it out to the the public repository this evening, so the code will be available then. Um, it currently it's kind of slow because I'm doing a lot of the byte work in PowerShell itself as opposed to doing it in C sharp. Uh, so we're going to move. A lot of that work over to C Sharp uh, using the native um, bit parsing libraries will speed things up. Uh, my testing, I can parse a one terabyte hard drive in about eight hours, which is, in my mind, it's, it's inexcusably slow, right? But if you have small system partitions, especially in data centers, frequently the system partition is significantly smaller than the data partitions, uh, you can still fly through those fairly quickly. Um, I intend to validate the results, right? Currently it's, I have pretty high confidence that the results are accurate. Again, it, I haven't gone through the exhaustive steps necessary um, to really prove that. So we're going to run it against the, the NIST forensics data sets, make sure that the data that I'm returning is the right information. Uh, And I got to the end a lot faster than I thought I would. Sorry. Um, so I guess let's kind of open it up for, for questions. Um, Kanza in and of itself, uh, the tool, these specific things, analysis techniques, anything you'd like to know? So in looking at using this as a PowerShell deal, each of the, the modules is a PowerShell script, right? Yes. So going into an environment, unless I'm mistaken, by default, PowerShell scripts you cannot run. Uh, that's disabled, you can run PowerShell commands but not scripts. So you have to turn that on, I presume. Is there a, a good way that you can control that or the script signed can use it as a signed scripts can run? How do you address that? So you can set it up to run sign scripts. Um, because of the way we're doing the invoke, um, it pushes the script down to the remote host, but it doesn't, um, the Windows remoting piece plus the uh, automatic administrative credentials that you get when you do that on the remote host actually bypasses execution policy restrictions. Okay. Um, so you don't run into that problem. Uh, 
least we've never run into it, and all of our hosts are set to require signed scripts, right? Okay, thanks. Um, WinRM does have to be remailable in the remote hosts, correct. Um, in a domain environment, if you don't have that set up, it's very easy to set up. You just push the GPO update. Uh, within 15 minutes, then WinRM will be remote, will be enabled on your remote hosts. Um, Yes. Yeah, so we are still operating out of Dave Pohl's calendar repository. Um, let me go back to that that slide so that you have the link. There we go. Yeah, so Git master file tables itself uh, hasn't been pushed. I'm doing that this evening. Um, and it, it will be committed tonight to the repository. Um, everything else is still there. Kanze is under active development. It's slowed down recently, um, primarily because I've been working on this module uh, and Dave has been doing other things. Um, but we're, we're picking it back up and, and refocusing on it. Uh, again, this is an open source project. It's community driven. Um, if you have ideas for modules, uh, build them yourself or open an issue. Um, we're always looking for new ways to use the tool, new improvements and new capabilities we can add to it. Um, we have some big plans coming up as far as performance improvements and things like that. We're gonna move a lot of things into C Sharp, um, pre-compile them so we don't have the on-the-fly compiler problems where we're actually writing files to the host that we're analyzing, right? It's a bad, idea, bad idea there. I have a question. All right. Hey, um, so I didn't notice a bit of a disclaimer like I see on Gurr's website, like, hey, we're not here to support. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been to the Gurr website, they're like, uh, you know, we use this in internal to our own environment. How do you guys stand on that and offering support? How much, I guess, manpower do you have to do that very thing? Um, doing the development for the tool and supporting the tool is part of our charter, part of our team's charter. Uh, but again, it's a secondary, it's a bef best effort thing for us. We're incident responders first, right? If our incident load is, is large or we have other things that we have to take care of in the environment, the Kanza development goes to a lower priority. Um, that said, Dave and I both spend a lot of our free time on this. Uh, and to date, we haven't had people bring up issues that we haven't been able to resolve pretty quickly. Um, we're, we're definitely committed to making sure that this tool works, to making sure that it works well and can be used in other environments. Um, and we've, we've started hearing about people actually using it. You know, um, Devin mentioned Kanza last night in his talk. We know that Mandiant uses it from time to time. Um, we know that Facebook uses it from time to time. Um, We've heard of a handful of other people that do use it. Uh, it's used very broadly inside Microsoft. A lot of the other security teams at Microsoft are using Kanza in their environments. Anything else? Yeah. <laughs> 